Shalom Israel, this is Sister Kana, and first and foremost, I have to give all glory and praise to Ahaya, Asho Ahaya, Bahashim Yishaya, Wak Vadash Wak. Okay, Israel, I wanted to make this video and um, to speak about Masada is Jerusalem. This will be part two, and what I will do is, the other video is very long, I know, and I put a lot of other information, but I'm going to... I'm going to, um, you know, cut it and just get to the part of, uh, you know, Masada is Jerusalem. And I will make that part one, and this will be part two. Okay, so I pray if you saw the video, praise the most high, higher. And if you have not, it's best that you watch that video first and so that you can get the gist of this video. But basically... I wanted to go into the Josephus. This is the Josephus, and it um, gives a lot of information on um, Jerusalem and, you know, things like that. So, uh, I hope you can follow along, but basically, I will give you the books. Now, if, for those of you who don't know, Josephus it was a Hebrew who recorded, actually, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and also um, in... Uh, what they say, Masada, I think it was in uh, 73 AD. But the understanding is out that they, um, although Josephus was a Hebrew, he was hired by the Romans to um, write and record the information about the fall of Jerusalem. So as we know, and I said this in my first video, that, you know, Although he was an eyewitness, he was there, he, um, he was a Hebrew, and he went through this whole thing. He was hired by the Romans, who are basically our enemies. So they actually got the information, and they can, you know, turn the narrative to whatever they want. And I believe that's the case with this, that although he recorded it, once they got the information, you know how Esau does, they will you know, rewrite it, you know, put their own pictures to it, and do whatever they have to do to um, write their own story. So we're going to go into this information, but I pray, please, that you watch part one first, because it goes into um, David um, buying the land from the Jebusites, actually having the land, and then Solomon building the temple on the land that David bought, which is from the dead. Um, Jebusites. And it also gives a lot of key information on um, how Masada was, um, the archaeologists went in, you know, went through a fine tooth comb in our city, and it had to be someplace special that they were, um, that they were tearing apart, meaning, you know, looking for, and doing digs and looking for archaeologists you know, archaeology evidence and things like that, finding the Dead Sea Scrolls in Masada and things like that. So I pray that you go into this information because this is information um, pertaining to a higher. These are the things that are important to the Most High. So after we wake up to the truth, which we all are doing, the first thing we must do is know to come out of Babylon, because that's why the Most High is waking us up. He's telling us our captivity is over, that we must come out of Babylon, and we must make our way within the borders. That is the second thing that you need to know, where you supposed to flee to. We are to come to Jordan. Jordan is the safe place for the Most High's people. This is the uh, place of refuge. There's something that I never really spoke about, but I maybe I need to do a video on this because I didn't, haven't brought it out. But in the scriptures, there are three cities of refuge on this side of the of the Jordan River that is spoken about. And it's spoken about that if anybody ever like committed a murder or a crime against another person and life was lost, that there was three cities of refuge that the person, the offender, can run to and be safe, be safe, and that the other family members wasn't allowed to take out revenge on him, you know, that kind of thing. That's initially what we, what it was about. But in the in the scriptures, it tells, um, he tells uh, Moses, the Most High tells him to tell the children of Israel about these three cities of refuge. There were actually six cities altogether, three in Israel and three in Jordan. 
So in Jordan, we're going to focus on Jordan because this is where we are supposed to come to as a place of refuge. Um, it, when it was given to Moses, he said, for those who are here today and for those in the future and those who are not here today, this place, these places will be refuge, refuges so that you can run to in case you're running for your life. So in this instances, we as Israel are running for our lives. We are coming out of Babylon and we are to come within the borders and we are coming here as a place of refuge. So that scriptures is in Deuteronomy and I have to bring it out and I'll put it in the description box. It tells us that we are, these are three cities on this side of the Jordan that are places of refuge, refuges for us. Okay, so praise the Hayyab Shaya. So I never really did a video on that, and I always meant to, but I wanted to bring that out. Also, I wanted to briefly say, because I didn't mention it in my last video, that uh, there's a um, the Jordanian embassy in America is offering a five year visa that we can now get. It's about one hundred and sixty dollars, I believe, which have went down because it was one hundred and eighty. But you can get a five year visa when you just send your passport to the Jordanian embassy in Washington. DC, and they'll send it back to you in five days that you don't have to worry about going in and out of the country like we used to do. I have done that for years, for maybe, you know, the eight to ten years I had to go in and out of, you know, the, the city of out, out of Jordan and come back in for years. And it's such a headache and it's such a blessing that the Most High opened it up. And that we can now, you can go and get a five-year visa, mail your passport in, and they can send it back to you. Okay, I just wanted to put that out there. Along with um, letting brothers and sisters know, you know, you can send me an email at I told you travel at yahoo.com. And I can give you information on migrating here to Jordan, some key information that you may need to come out. But I would like to say to brothers and sisters that you must be wise as serpents and harmless as doves as you start to make your way out of Babylon. It seems that a lot of people, actually some people get to, they could make in their mind that they want to go to Israel. Now listen, the scriptures tell us not to go into the cities of Israel, but I find that a lot of brothers and sisters try to go to Israel because they want to see what's going on there. They want to see the Holy Land. Whatever the reason is that they decide to go in, I I am trying to tell people, do not go into Israel. I know you want to go in there, but for one thing, they're making it very hard for um, Israelites, black people on the whole, to even enter it. They'll, they will stop you at the border. They question you for hours. They do not want you to go in there for some reason. They're being very selective all of a sudden. And then they'll, um, they then once they deny you, and then people try to come and try to come into Jordan, they will deny you at the border in Jordan as well. And there have been a lot of people who have been turned back and sent back to America because they're making certain decisions. And instead of, like I'm telling you, this is treating this as a, a thing of importance and that this is a place of refuge and you are running for your life. It's not a vacation. It's not something that you should be taking very lightly. You should act like you're coming to a place and you come in here because your life depends upon it. And you don't need to be making, you know, unnecessary decisions. You must be wise, brothers and sisters, and treat this as a very sensitive matter. And do not come like you just come, you go into a party. Because this is not a party and it's not a game. We're dealing with the Most High. We're dealing with His... Um, him allowing us to come out of Babylon based on the things that we're praying to him and asking him to do for us and making us a way. So when you come out of here, you need to be on your best behavior. You need to be on your P's and Q's and you need to act like you have some sense. Okay. I, I just need to put it plainly because, you know, our, you know, a lot of Hebrew Israelites are coming out and they think that this is a game or it's a party or they're coming out 
you know, and not being responsible and taking care of the most high's business. So I need to really reiterate that. And I don't want to make it too long and drawn out, but I pray you receive what I'm saying in love and with kindness and in meek and humbleness, which brothers and sisters need to get themselves together. Because a lot of people just coming out and just, you know, first of all, they have a lot of spirits on them and they act, acting and, you know, operating like, I don't want, I just want to say like demons for one. You have to get yourselves together, okay? For one thing, get your spirit right, be fasting and praying so that the Holy Spirit can lead you and guide you so that you can make the right decisions, okay? So I'm going to leave that there for now because I don't want to make this video too long. But this video is about Masada is Jerusalem. And I want to go into the scriptures <clears throat> and bring these things out. Now we're going to be going into the book of Josephus and skipping around from the antiquities of the Jews, the war of the Jews, and things like that. But just to show and reiterate that Masada is Jerusalem. This is our our holy city. And we are not to go into Israel right now. Christ, Yeshua, is going to bring us into Israel. But the Most High obviously feels it's important that Israel needs to know where this holy city is. It's Masada, and we have been lied to. Now, we need to come out of Babylon. We need to get within the borders, and we will be in Kadesh. That's where the Most High will have us, and he will purge us, and we will go through, you know, and learn more about him and how to worship him before Christ bring us into Masada. So, um... When you go into the first video, I give you a lot of information, but I wanted to give you some um, information from the book of Josephus because it, it goes into detail. Um, when you go into the um, Antiquities of the Jews, book 8, chapter 3, it's the introduction of the building of the tabernacle. And you can read this on your own because I'm not going to go, it's, a, it's pretty long, but basically it tells you that um, how Solomon started to build the temple on the land that was given to David, you know, that was shown to David by the Most High. And he builds the temple there and, um, you know, and he starts to build the town, the foundations of the temple on the, on the ground and the materials with stones and, you know, it goes on and on. So I just wanted to, re, to re point you to that. So you need to go into that. The Antiquities of the Jews, Book 8, Chapter 3. And it talks about Solomon actually building the temple, right? And also the scriptures, you know, that goes with it as well. But, um, I want to point to how we know that, first of all, King Herod, he... In his, I think it was his 15 years of as king, he rebuilt the temple. Now, there's a lot of confusion about Harid, Herod, I'm sorry, Harid, <laughs> King Herod, and him building this temple because they try to say that the site where the Jews are calling Jerusalem today. Is that site, and because we were asleep and we were we lost our, our you know our remembrance, we don't know what they're talking about basically. So it's important that we go into this. So King Herod actually, according to Josephus, rebuilt the temple that Solomon built. Okay, because we know that the the the, the it was destroyed several times. So under King Herod, he rebuilt the temple so so that means so when we go into Matthew 24 it tells us that Christ was standing at the temple and he tells the disciples that um, eventually the temple will be destroyed and there will be no stone left unturned right so of course Christ knew that that place was the real Jerusalem he wouldn't have been sitting prophesying to the um, 12 disciples about a fake Jerusalem. He obviously was in the right, in the correct location 
telling the 12 disciples that this place was going to eventually be destroyed, right? And that was right, that was after King Herod had already died. Because remember, King Herod was the king who was trying to um, get Yeshia killed at his birth. That was the same king. He knew that the Savior was going to come into the earth. He sent out the three uh, men to try to find him to locate where he was so that eventually he could destroy him. So this same king, Herod, is the one who built this temple. But it was after his death when Christ was standing you know, looking at the grounds and told the 12 disciples that eventually this um, place will be destroyed and there will be no um, stone left, you know, left up. They will be completely destroyed. So I just wanted to reiterate that so that we'll understand where we are and um, what we're talking about. You know, King Herod rebuilt the temple that Solomon had had initially built, okay? And Christ prophesied that it would be destroyed, okay? So let's not get um, confused because they do try to confuse us and say that, oh, um, King Herod built many sites, and he did, with fortresses, and he, he built these things. But it only shows that he actually built maybe uh, three, right? One was in Samaria, which we know Samaria is not Jerusalem. So we know that's not. And actually Samaria is the is the area where those brothers, uh, Kenya and um, Hawasha, they're over there in, is in Israel in Tel Arad claiming that to be Jerusalem. But it's not Jerusalem. Masada is Jerusalem, just so you'll know. Okay, so let me go find the chapters and verse uh, where King Harad starts to build the temple. So that you guys can... Okay. Give me a second. You know what I mean, I always have to take my time. Okay. Okay, so when you go into the Antiquities of the Jews, book 15, chapter 8. The Antiquities of the Jews, Book 15, Chapter 8. It reads, uh, Chapter 8, Verse 5, it says, Since therefore he had now the city fortified by the palace in which he lived, and by the temple which had a strong fortress by it, called Antonia, and was rebuilt by himself, he contrived to make Samaria a fortress for himself also against all the people and called it Sabeti, supposing that this place would be a stronghold against the country, not inferior to the former. Okay, so this chapter is just, re I really want to start with this chapter to let you know that this, he's not talking about Samaria. Okay, he said, he, he considered to make Samaria a fortress for himself also. So this is not talking about Samaria. He's talking about the palace with, also with the, with the temple. Let me read it again. Since therefore he had now the city fortified by the palace in which he lived and by the temple. So we're talking about the temple, which had a strong fortress. Strong fortress is a big um, place like a mountain, and in Hebrew, fortress means mas is called is called masada. Masada means fortress, but there were many different type of fortresses. But this fortress is right by the temple. Okay, there's there's only one fortress like that where King Solomon built 
the temple right by this fortress, okay? So this is the same um, fortress that King Herod now is rebuilding, okay? So he's, so I just wanted to call it, and he called it Antonia, and I'll go into that. Okay, when you go down to book 15, chapter 11, verse 4, it says, But for the tower itself, when Herod the king of the Jews had fortified it more firmly than before, in order to secure and guard the temple, he gratified Antonius, who was his friend and the Roman ruler, and then gave it the name of Tower and of Antonia. So now he's given, he's calling this place Antonia. So this is the place where King Herod rebuilt the temple and had a fortress right by it. And he called it Antonia, okay? Tower of Antonia. So just keep that in mind. So now it's clear that the most, I'll read it again, chapter, verse 4, book 15, chapter 11, verse 4. But for the tower itself, when Herod the king of the Jews had fortified it more firmly than before in order to secure and guard the temple. Okay, so we're talking about the temple, the most highest temple. He rebuilt it. And he renamed it. He gratified Antonius, who was his friend, the Roman ruler, and gave it the name of Tower of Antonia. Okay, so that scripture clarifies that King Herod rebuilt this um, the temple and the tower, he named it Antonia. When he's talking about the tower, he's talking about this fortress. Right by it, he put this tower. Okay, and I'll, you know, prove that in another passage, Okay. Okay, when you go down to verse uh, 7, it says, There was also an occult passage built for the king. It led from Antonia to the inner temple and its eastern gate, over which he also erected for himself a tower. So that's where the tower comes in. That he might have the opportunity of a subterraneous ascent to the temple, okay? So when you go back in, into part one, when I go into um, David um, being in this subterraneous area, when he's about to take down the Jebusites, it all, you know, precept upon precept, it, it makes sense, okay? So again, he, a subterraneous ascent to the temple in order to guard against any sedition which might be made by the people against their kings, it is also reported that during the time that the temple was building, it did not rain in the daytime, but that the showers fell in the nights, so that the work was not hindered. And this our fathers have delivered to us, nor is it incredible. If anyone had regarded to the manifestations of Ahia, and thus was performed the work of the rebuilding of the temple. Okay, so it's clear that this is pertaining to the temple, that he called this place Antonia, and he made a tunnel, you know, like a bridge, so to connect to the temple and to where he had built, you know, his, his little palace or castle or whatever. So it's m making it clear that this area where Herod rebuilt the temple is the same area where Solomon built this temple, okay? And I already pulled in part one that this is Masada, that Masada is Jerusalem, okay? Okay, hold on, I'm going to let this pass. Okay, I just wanted that um, prayer to finish. Okay, so now when you go into book 18, chapter 4, verse 3, it says this. There was one of the high priests named Hyrcanus, and as there were many of that name, he was the first of them. This man built a tower near the temple, and when he had done so, he generally dwelt in it and had these vestments with him, because it was lawful for him alone to put them on, and he had them there. Reposited, 
when he went down to the city and took his ordinary garments, the same things were continued to be done by his sons and by their sons after them. But when Herod be, um, came to be king, he rebuilt this tower, which was very conveniently situated in a magnificent manner. And because he was a friend of Antonius, he called it by the name of Antonia. Again, it's, it's just reiterating about this tower, which is right next to the temple that was built by, rebuilt by King Herod, but eventually it was, um, now it's saying that this high priest had built this, um, this, this tower because he was the high priest and he wanted to make it convenient for when he goes to the temple to change his clothes and so on and so forth. So this was after Solomon had built the uh, temple for the, you know, the whole temple for the most high. This high priest comes along and he builds this tower that's right next to the temple. And then King Herod himself rebuilt this tower. And that's what he's calling part of the Antonius, okay, which is by Masada, which is by the palace connected to the temple, okay? So I just wanted to reiterate these um, chapters and verses to show you how it all concur with the Bible and what I'm speaking about, Masada is Jerusalem, okay? So let's continue. So that is the antiquity, now antiquities of the Jews. That was book 18, chapter four. Now we're gonna go to antiquities of the Jews. Book 20, chapter 5, verse 3, it says, But when he could not induce them to be quiet, for they still went on in their reproach to him, he gave order that the whole army should take their entire armor and come to Antonia, which was a fortress, as, he, as, we, have already, as we have said already which overlooked the temple. Again, it's just reiterating that this fortress was, is called Antonia, and there's also a tower he, he's calling Antonia as well. Okay, so it says, Antonia, which was a fortress, as we have said already, which overlooked the temple. But when, he, when the multitude saw the soldiers there, they were affrighted at them and ran away hastily. But as the passengers outward but narrow and as they thought their enemies followed them they were crowded together in their flight and a great number of them pressed to death in those narrow passages nor indeed was the number fewer than 20,000 that perished in this tumult so uh, so this is just talking about an uprising that happened during the time of King Herod and around the fortress and the tower okay but basically, it's just reiterating that there was a fortress, Masada, which means fortress, and um, King Herod renamed it Antonia, and it overlooked the temple, okay? Now, I would like to put some pictures up because I told you guys I'm having issues with my videos, with editing, and this and that. I can't even do that, but maybe I'll do a part three with just pictures and just showing you different angles of Masada and how these scriptures uh, coincide, okay, because I can't really do it, I'm having issues, and since my last video, they're even messing with my account, so I pray that, you know, the most high keep my account up, but if not, you know, I have other, um, uh, other accounts that, you know, if you can start subscribing to, in case this, uh, this YouTube channel goes down, I will re-upload on my other channels as well, okay? Okay, so let me let me go to the War of the Jews, book one, chapter three. And again, I'll put all these book, chapter, and verses in the description box so that you can go over it yourself, okay? It says, now, Artabulius, by degree, and unwillingly gave credit to these accusations. And accordingly, he took care not to discover his suspicions openly. Though he provided to be secure against any accidents, so he placed the guard of his body in a certain dark subterraneous passage, for he lay sick in a place called formerly the citadel, 
though afterwards its name was changed to Antonia. So basically, this is just letting you know that there was a citadel. This was considered the citadel, and afterwards it was named, it was changed names to Antonia, which King Herod and Herod eventually changed the name to Antonia. So I'm just showing you place, um, you know, scriptures in the Josephus that's giving you this um, information about this Antonia, which is also Masada, this fortress that overlooks the temple that was rebuilt by King Herod, but initially built by Solomon, our temple in Jerusalem. Now, again, it, it goes into that subterranean passage. This also, it, it, it links up and it precepts to David when he bought the, the land and he wants to take down the Jebusites. He had to go to the subterranean passage. So I just want to point that out. You know, so that you'll uh, understand this is all the same uh, place. Okay. Now, if you go into the Water of the Jews, book one, chapter 21, it, verse one, it goes, it reads this. Accordingly, in the 15th year of his reign, Harad rebuilt the temple. Okay. And compassed a piece of land about it with a wall, which land was twice as large as that before enclosed. So he's saying it was bigger. The expenses he laid upon it was vastly large also, and the riches about it were unspeakable, a sign of which you have in great cloisters that were erected about the temple and the citadel, which was on its north side. The cloisters he built from the foundation, but the citadel he repaired at a vast expense, nor was it other than a royal palace, which he called Antonia in honor of Anthony. Again, it's just reiterating that it says in the beginning, Herod was rebuilding the temple in his 15th year, and he compassed a piece of land, and it goes on to tell you that he, it was a royal palace that he built. There was a citadel nearby, and that's like an arena where they do the, uh, you know, challenges and things of that nature. Hold on one second. Okay, so this passes, this is the second time it, it mentions there's also a citadel. Now, you know, we don't really, it don't really go into the Bible that there's this citadel that's relatively near to Masada or to the temple. But here it's saying that there's also a citadel that's in that area, okay? So that's very interesting. So, you know, we're going to go into that as well. Okay, when you go in the War of the Jews, book 2, chapter 15, verse 6, it reads this. But for the for, for the Sididius, they were afraid lest Florus should come again and get possession of the temple through Antonia. So they got immediately upon those cloisters of the temple that joined to Antonia and cut them down. Okay, so this again is just showing you, this is the War of the Jews, and they were afraid that um, some people were going to come in, and they was going to gain passage through the um, through Antonia, which is Masada, and come through those cloisters that Herod built, and get and gain access to the temple, That's, that joined Masada to the temple, because I told you before that Herod built a bridge, and I think also Solomon had a bridge also that connected um, the palace, which is on top of Masada, to the temple, so it can be easy access for him, the king, to go back and forth to the temple. So again, it's just um, these passages are putting the pieces together on how Masada is connected to the temple and how this whole area was considered Jerusalem. Okay, here we go. Okay, let's see. Uh, 
Now, if you go into the War of the Jews, book 2, chapter 17, it says, But on the next day, which was the 15th of the month of Lowe's, they made an assault upon Antonia and besieged the garrison, which was in it two days, and then took the garrison and slew them and set the citadel on fire. After which they, mar they marched to the palace, whither the king's soldiers were fled and parted themselves into four bodies and made an attack upon the walls. Okay, this is the war of the Jews, and they're actually going in to um, getting, um, gaining access to Mas uh, Masada upon Antonia and besieging the garrison which they put around it. Okay, so now this sounds exactly like the Masada situation because actually they actually merged these two stories. Just like in the Bible, when, when we read the scriptures in Exodus and it talks about when um, Moses struck the rock, there's two incidences where Moses struck the rock. But actually, it's the same incidences, but in different books. And when you read it, it's, it, it sounds like it's two separate, um, you know, accounts. But actually, it's the same account. Because you got to understand, Israel, we needed to go under the curse. And the Most High needed to hide this information from us. So that during our captivity, we wouldn't really understand. And it's the same thing with this. These are the same accounts of two different books the book, the Antiquity of the Jews and the War of the Jews, but actually talking about the siege of Jerusalem. And they made it in two separate stories because the Romans wanted to, you know, narrate their own story. And they didn't want us to find out where our holy city was. The city of David. Praise the higher. Okay, so uh, let me continue finding some more information. Now, I have a lot of, I have a lot of, scriptures that I took from the Josephus just so I could, it's easier for me to read it faster instead of me going, you know, throughout the whole book. Okay, hold on. Okay, here's a good one, but it's kind of long, but I'm going to read it. Okay, it's um, the War of the Jews, book five, chapter four, and we're going to start at, um, Chapter verse 2. The second war took its beginning from the gate, which was called Ganath, which belonged to the first war. It only compassed the northern quarter of the city and reached as far as the tower Antonio. So this is just giving you some, um, you know, geographical insight about, you know, the city of Jerusalem and where the tower Antonia of Antonia was. Okay, also then it says it was Agrippa who encamped who encompassed the parts added to the old city with this wall, which had been all naked before. For as the city grew more populous, it gradually crept beyond its old limits. And those parts of it that stood northward of the temple and joined that hill to the city made it considerably larger and occasioned that hill which is in number the fourth and is called Bezethra to be inhabited also. It lies over against the tower Antonia, but is divided by it by a deep valley which was dug on purpose and that in order to hinder the foundations of the tower of Antonia from joining to this hill and thereby affordingly an opportunity for getting to it with ease and hindering the security that arose from its superior elevation for which reason also, that depth of the ditch made the elevation of the towers more remarkable. So this is just giving you some insight on how Masada is, and we know how massive it is, and how hard it is to get to, and how they dug ditches 
um, dividing a valley to make it even harder to get from the, you know, from Masada to the tower and to the temple. Okay, so all of this stuff, it just gives you more and more insight of how Masada, which we already know, is a huge piece of land, but also it has a lot of other hills around it. And this is what it's saying. So there's other hills, there's a citadel, there's a tower, there's the Masada, and then there's the, the temple. So there's a lot of, you know, information that we can go on that puts the pieces together on where our holy city Jerusalem is, which it is encompassed around Masada, okay? Okay, so let me see. Uh, okay, in book five, chapter five, it says introduction and description of the temple. Now, I'm not going to read all of it, but you can you can read this on your own. And it's best to go in to study yourself a fool so that you can get an outline. Because this information is important to the Most High because he wouldn't have me going into this. And I pray that you brothers, you know, revisit this information about Masada is Jerusalem. And so that we can, you know, have a, a map of what it is the Most High wants us to do and where he wants us to be. Okay? Praise the Most High. Okay, so it reads this. Book 5, Chapter 5, Introduction, a description of the temple. Starting at 2. It says, the cloisters of the outermost court were in a breadth, breadth 30 cubits, while the entire compass of it was by measure 6 furlongs, including the Tower of Antonia. Those entire courts that were, were exposed to the air were laid with stones of all sorts. Okay? So it's just giving you a description. Then you jump down to A. It says, Now, as to the Tower of Antonio, it was situated at the corner of two cloisters of the court of the temple, of that on the west and that on the north. It was erected upon a rock of 50 cubits in height and was on the great preceptress. It was the work of the King Herod, wherein he demonstrated his natural magnanimity in the first place. The rock itself was covered over with smooth pieces of stone from its foundation, both for ornament and that anyone who would either try to get up or to go down, it might not be able to hold his feet upon it. Next to this, and before you come to the edifice, edifice of the tower itself, there was a wall three cubits high, but within that wall, all the space of the tower of Antonia itself was built upon it, the height of 40 cubits. Okay, so it just goes on and gives you um, some description of how the, um, the Tower of Antonio was connected to the temple and also how it also connected to the, the uh, Masada, the fortress, because he made a passageway for him to be able to get to this fortress. Okay? Praise Ahaya Bahashim Okay. Okay. Okay, let me go down, jump into that same verse, but I'll jump down some more. Okay, let's see. Mm. Okay, it says, and as the entire structure resembled that of a tower, it contained also four other distinct towers at its four corners, where whereof the others were but fifty cubits high, whereas that which lay upon the east, I mean the southeast corner was seventy cubits high that from thence the whole temple might be viewed. But on the corner where it joined to the two cloisters of the temple, it had passages down to them both, through which the guard, for there was always lay in the tower a Roman legion, went several ways among the cloisters with their arms on the Jewish festivals in order to watch the people that they may not their attempt to make any innovations for the temple was a fortress 
that guarded the city. Okay, for the temple was a fortress that guarded the city, as was the tower of Antonia, a guard to the temple. And in that tower were the guards of those three. There was also a particular fortress belonging to the upper city, which was Herod's palace. That fortress is what where I'm telling you is Masada. He, Herod rebuilt it and made it his palace. But for the hill, Bezasra, we, that's the, another hill. He said there's other hills surrounding it. Which it was divided from the tower Antonio, as we have already told you. And as that hill on which the tower of Antonio stood was the highest of these three, so did it adjoin the new city and was the only place that hindered the site of the temple on the north. And this shall suffice as present to have spoken about the city and the walls about it, because I have I have proposed to myself to make a more accurate description of it elsewhere. So I'm giving you all these different points where Josephus goes in and speaks about how Masada, this huge fortress, was connected and how King Herod rebuilt it to make it connect to the um, temple, our holy temple, which was also, it overlooked the city, the whole city of Jerusalem. And when I put a picture up, you can see how Masada just stands and oversee, you know, this whole landmass. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to jump around because I want to go down now when this uh, last part of this, there's, uh, there's many more scriptures but I am jumping around but there's one in particular and I probably will close with that because um, this was a speech by Eleazar he was the leader at Masada okay now this puts the icing on the cake to let you know you know that they're merging these these stories okay this is speech by Eleazar the leader at Masada war of the Jews Book 7, chapter 8, verse 7. It says, Where is this city that was believed to have Ahiah himself inhabiting therein? It is now demolished to very foundations and have nothing but the monuments of it preserved. I mean the camp of those that have destroyed it, which still dwells upon its ruin. Some unfortunate old men also lie upon the ashes of the temple, and a few women are there preserved alive by the enemy for our bitter shame and reproach. Now, who is there who re revolves these things in his mind and yet is able to bear the sight of the sun, though he might live out of danger? Who is there who... Who is there so much his country's enemy or so unmanly and so desirous of living as not to repent that he is still alive? And I cannot but wish that we had all died before we had seen this holy city demolished by the hands of our enemies or the foundation of our holy temple dug up after so profound a manner. Okay. So this is a, one of the leaders at Masada. He's talking about Masada, but he's referring to the Holy Temple. So this kind of puts it, the icing on the cake, that Masada is Jerusalem. Even in his speech, the leader of Masada, who was, you know, speaking about the Masada incident, he's referring to the Holy City and the, the, um, the Temple the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. So, guys, I pray that you go into the information. I tried to cut it short so that it wouldn't be too, too long because I, you know, I want you to be able to focus and pay attention. I'll link these. Give me some time, though. I'll put the video up and I'll gradually put these scriptures in the description box so you can go into it yourself and study to show yourself approved. It's very important that we know where our holy city is. It's Masada. Second, also learning our language. 
We really have to get serious about learning our holy language. And I pray, brothers and sisters, really take it serious that we know our language because that is part of us coming back as a nation. Time is drawing near. We're running out of time. I pray you get out of Babylon. There is no more time. Like I always, always say, Ahia said, come out of her, my people. There's no reason for you to sit there and wait for the to this destruction that is coming. Trust in the Baha in Ahaya Bashim and Shaya and believe on him. Because a lot of people are not taking these um, you know, what the most high said is going to happen. Anybody who's sitting in, in Babylon telling you to prepare by buying food, by you know, getting some land somewhere, has got to be an agent. That's all I can really say. It doesn't make any sense for anyone to sit there and tell you, oh, buy some food and prepare for what's coming. There's only death, mourning, and destruction that's coming. Ahia said that place will be no more. There is no reason for anybody to try to tell you to sit in Babylon and go into another area and wait within, those, in, within Babylon. Unless they're an agent and they're trying to have you destroyed. So I pray you take heed to this information. Get out. The Most High is revealing his truth. These are the things that's important to Ahia, Asha Ahia. His holy land, his holy mountain where we will receive his laws again and his statutes. And his holy land in Jerusalem where we will end up be where Christ will lead us to. You need to know and learn learning his language. I pray you take heed. I pray that you see the importance in this, that the Holy Spirit leads, and, leads you and guides you. I pray you're fasting and praying and making your way out of Babylon. Again, if you want information on Jordan, send me an email, I-T-O-J-A, travel at yahoo.com so that you can know what to do, how to prepare, and get yourself ready. Again, we are doing um, Passover in Kadesh, and we're really excited about that. We're going to start preparing when we pray, brothers and sisters, come out. Um, I pray you support, you know, what's being done here. We're working on the tabernacle. Please. If you want to um, support that, you know, you can send send me an email at I told you travel at yahoo.com. You can go to my website or you can also go to Hebrewism.com and I'll put all the stuff in the description box that you can support. You can buy some clothing. I got oils and soaps and, you know, a lot of stuff um, coming up and some new stuff also that I'm introducing. So praise Ahia. But I pray you look into this information. This is Ahia's business. This is the things that Ahia is concerned with. Where his holy mountain is, where are we going to be in the wilderness, how to get there, and Jerusalem, his, his, his holy city. You should know these things about the Most High. So I pray you receive it. I bless the name of Ahia Bahashim and Shaya Wakwadash Walk. And I say Shalom. I pray I see you soon. The water.